today. Thank you again for the opportunity that we have to be gathered with you. Thank you for uh, being our Father, our, uh, our teacher, our, our Redeemer, our Master, and, and, and everything that um, you are in our life. Without you, we don't live and breathe and have a being at all. We know that everything has been gifted to us, um, the very nature of how we think and breathe and everything. It's just the, the intricate details of our lives, our bodies, our spirit, soul, everything about us is uh, because that's how you made us. And it's all because you gave us the ability, you gave us the, uh, the understanding of anything we have. We, we know that uh, without you we have no life in, in, in the physical. We always I know without you we have no life in the spiritual. You know, we have no insights apart from your ability to show us those things, your decisions, your free adoring will before time to give us those things. And so it's just so much to really wrap your arms around to think who we are, where we are, personality-wise, experience-wise, spiritual understanding-wise, physically, um, strengths, weaknesses, all the things that you have forged in us are for your purpose, your glory, because that's what you felt your goodwill and pleasure uh, in doing so. And so I just come to grips with all that is just so difficult to understand why you do what you do and, and how you do it. So, But we thank you for it and help us to continue to come to grips with understandings of, of just who you are and what your word has said and continues to say to us in these times past to these people. Uh, we look at our, our, our entire life now and the needs that we have as a people continuously and uh, we have highlights of anniversaries and birthdays that come and go and these great joys of remembrance of what you've given to us and yet we also have the times of physical uh, ailments of our loved ones and of ourselves and of different situations uh, spiritually, financially, and physically, and emotionally and we just ask that your blessings would be upon all the needs that we know that we have and uh, you continue to meet those needs with the best and suitable way that you know best and Help us to understand and embrace the acceptance of your will in our lives. So be with us now. Continue to be our teacher, our counselor, our guide as you continue to unfold and, and just reveal to us the truth in your word as you can continue to show us as you use, uh, we believe, the, the writer here in, in, in Barnabas to have such an experience of what you have given to him and through him and all around him to be the one fitted to, uh, to write these things and insight about how we are to be prepared as believers and uh, what's out ahead for us. So continue to teach and guide and direct. May all the things be said and done be pleasing to you. May you be uh, just pleased with, again, all the understanding of us being at your feet, learning from you and you alone. We ask all these things in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. We pray. So this lessons uh, for today, of course, will be on Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, we went through Hebrews 1 and 2. We went through introduction, I should say, for quite a bit, then Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 2, and it's quite a bit. So a um, couple things to, to preface and and to make sure we're understanding. I, as you can see, I erased the initial, I kept up the initial introduction and other snippets for the first many lessons so that it would seem it's kind of there in front of you constantly with the other messages. But now it's time to move on and um, continue to take chapter three and move forward. And I'm just doing synopsises now to remind you that again, and a book was written by the AD 60, 61 by Barnabas because he was a Levite influenced by Paul, insight into leadership and early beginnings of Acts. And it's unique to this book. Um, he also is, uh, it's a book of encouragement, and he was the encourager. Um, he was called that, so he was called the encourager. And the book's about encouraging us. The encourager. The book's about encouraging us to continue on. And, and so it's, again, written to mature ones as a focus on obtaining the highest maturity unto a position for airship in day eight, meaning he wants us to have the highest level of, of entrance into day seven so that we can have the opportunity uh, to, in other words, be said that we're the betrothed bride, to be known that we are then the revealed bride in day eight in the airship. But in order to get there, this is the preparatory ground in Hebrews. And then, of course, chapter one, he focuses on who Jesus is. He's the creator, the rightful heir of all things, the prophet, the high priest, the coming king, uh, what Jesus has done. He's appreciation, now the appreciators, high priest. Uh, to provide us the resources to succeed. Um, he gives us accountability of all believers, but the focal point is on those uh, much is given, much is required, meaning the mature ones are more culpable. That's us. And then he gives resources of ministering spirits, angels given as tutors, if you will, along with the teacher, the Holy Spirit, uh, to help us overcome. And then I put chapter two, and I kind of stopped here because the warning was about in chapter two, to sum up the warning was to stay focused and attentive don't cross the line, listen intently to God, and do not devalue him or his word. It's pretty simple, straightforward stuff, but it sounds like it's easier said than done. People say, oh, it's not, how, why would I, I would never do that? 
well, I wouldn't go so far because I, I would say that the apostles did this. You know, they didn't, they focused on attentive. They, they didn't, and then you say, well, how do I prove that? Because they weren't there at the crucifixion, uh, except for one. I mean, I'm just, come on. And then you're going to say, they, did they cross the line? Yeah, sure they did. Yeah, they, they had, they, they crossed the line because, you know, Peter, uh, you know, compromised his principles. That shouldn't happen, right? Paul, you know, berated a young man. Should have not done that. That wasn't cool. Uh, listen and tell me to God that they, uh, they do that originally? No, they didn't hear what he was saying in the parables. Even though he said, do you understand these things? He goes, yeah, we, we, we do. No, no, you don't. You don't understand what you're saying. And so, you know, it, there's all these things. And, and, of course, don't devalue him or his word. I think that that's what um, Judas uh, was guilty of doing. Mainly, I point to him and uh, devaluing what Christ said he was going to do. For, and Peter did the same thing. You know, you know I'm not going to have this happen. You can't just usurp what God says is going to happen or what God says is true because it doesn't hit you the right way. Because uh, it doesn't fit your agenda, that you can't do that. So, anyway, there's a lot of different things about the book of Hebrews, but to go back to remind you, uh, we, we cannot uh, continue forward with this thought process that it's written to a group of people that, that may be a little bit short of knowing who Jesus is. That, that's just a bunch of ignorance, okay? I think we have nailed that coffin shut. We're not going to go back and continue to revisit that. But again, the book of Hebrews is written only to people who already know who Jesus is. They're already in a testament, they're already covered by the blood of Jesus. So that's right, folks. Everybody you read about from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through the whole book is people that are in testament, in testament. Now, granted, uh, he's talking about people that the majority of them, hence to the Hebrews, that are Hebraic Christian people. So in other words, they were Christian folks who were Hebrews or Jewish people. They were either from the origination or they were proselyte Jewish people, one of the two, but dominantly, um, genetically speaking, Jewish people uh, that came to faith in who Jesus is as Messiah, Mashiach. Now, that's the audience. So you can differentiate or, or, or think differently, but it's going to confuse you as you go through this book, and we cannot allow that to creep into your minds and, and let you think, which also has crept into my mind, which I have found out in revealing in Chapter 3, is that our things of how we think about the kingdom things, as we call it, there are certain demarcations that, that we um, have used to say in the past. And if you remember, um, I don't remember when it goes, it was years ago, we saw there was two growth cycles. There's a growth cycle of sporos, the word of God, and there's a growth cycle in the sperma, the word of the kingdom, or the signature of the kingdom of the God. So we know there's two different growth cycles depending on what the criteria is. One criteria is like graduating high school to get a diploma from the word of God, hundred full fruit. One is the secrets of the kingdom of the God to graduate that level of obtaining the highest level of understanding of the secrets and mysteries applied, right? But that's, that's really hard to do. But the reality is just the same, that you have to have that duality of understanding of growth, right? Well, with that being said, what I had made a mistake on, and what I found out in chapter 3, was that when I was reading the book of Hebrews before not studying it, I would take out certain words, like medicoy. And I'd say, oh, medicoy is referring to those who are of the sporos, and not realizing that medicoy, I, sh I should know this, I mean, it's just like a duh, but medicoy, oi, means those of, those who are a partaker, so those of the medicos, so of the medicos, there's a certain medicoy among that medicos he's talking about, which is like, oh my gosh. Hence the phrasing soon medicoy is those amongst that group of medicos, there's a unique group of those who are with the soon medicoy. And so both of those oi represent, as we always see in scripture, a group among another group. So it's a faction amongst a larger group. So whenever you see oi, it means those there or those among that or those from that. Okay, it's not by itself. It's never by itself. It's always used in contrast. It's always used as a reference, uh, a piece from, you know, a remnant of, something like that, okay? It's always used, again, in a reference to another group. So as soon as you see medicoy, I thought, I I've never focused on that, right? And, I've and I thought, well, unless the word is of itself, the root word ends with oi, then that's different. But, but it doesn't. The, the actual root word is medicos, which means it's been changed grammatically. And when that happens, then it's definitively a group amongst a group. And I went, oh my gosh, all this time I've missed that. And so what he's talking about is that just like we have reconciliation to sporos, just like we have reconciliation to sperma, just like you can be a patty on in sporos, you can be a patty on in sperma. We, we know this, right? Well, the same holds true for this word medicos. But if you're a medicos, you're of sporos. But if you're a medicoi, you're among those who are partakers at a lower level. But now you're those, they're partakers of the heavenly calling. So therefore, those can be medicoi who are in this position uh, to have been given the heavenly calling. So who, who's that? Well, those are those people referenced in Luke 19 who were given the secret meaner, right? 
So the, the, the silver. So that means from a person of mikros up, being sanctified upward, those people are, are seen as mikroi among the mikros of the, of the Holy Spirit's fruit yielding in their life. Those are mikros. The Holy Spirit has fruit yielding of uh, love and peace and all this. So the mikros are the hundredfold sporos people, right? Th those are mikros. But then the mikroi are among those people are those who have been given a heavenly calling. And that's the, those who are sanctified, to not, the, not the other ones who had to fall by the ra roadside, which are the you know, brephos and nephios of sperma. The mikros of sperma, those and up, are the, the medicoi. So that would make more sense now when we go into chapter 3. And, and when you see this, and you'll, you'll see in chapter 3, as he says, you'll see he, br he brings it out to make it more clearly. I'm just trying to give you the framework, but here's the scripture telling it to you in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, pay attention now, he says, Ag he says, Adelphoi Agioi of calling heavenly medicoi. So he's telling you of those Adelphoi, of those brethren who are holy, it's those who are medicoi. And who were they? Those are the ones going back to chapter 2, verse 10. He told you already, it's those many oi, those sons, those weo, those weos people. He's talking about those those sons he's going to do earlier. He's taking those Adelphoi. If you lead, if you look through. He's the, he's the prince of their salvations, <coughs> excuse me, and in verse, uh, as I said, verse 10, he's the prince of the salvation, but in verse 11, excuse me, is where the Adelphoi, so he says, those are the ones who are Agia, they're, they're the ones who are Agia Oi, they're the ones that are, that are being sanctified, and those are the ones who are the Adelphos, he says there, but then later on he says Adelphois in verse 12, that he's not ashamed of the Adelphos, and he says the Adelphois, are those in the midst of the congregation is going to praise. And he's pointing out the top pation in verse uh, 12, excuse me, in verse uh, 13 and in verse 14. So all this flow of, of chapter 2 is about the, of the brethren, there's the Adelphoi amongst the brethren, because remember he's talking to mature ones specifically, but in view as people that believe in, in Christ, in general speaking, that are of the kingdom understanding. But he's specifically highlighting those who have been given the higher culpability, who are in a position, and hence he's talking about the ministering spirits in chapter 1 given to those people. So remember, just because he's focused in on a group does not mean other people don't hear him, remember? Because even though the apostles, you had Peter, James, and John, who were always called out, but all 12 would hear him teach, right? They, would hear, they all hear him teach, but you knew that those three heard him differently than the others because of their close proximity of relationship, right? And you could even say John even more so. And so, <coughs> just like anything else, you have him right now in today's modern world, the word is out there for everybody to read, and people can read Hebrews, and those who don't know the truth can read the same words we read and not understand a thing they're reading. And yet we read it and go, how can you not see that, right? It's the same words, it's just they don't, doesn't resonate with them because the Spirit does not allow them to see that. And some of it's based upon their inability of not wanting to be different, and some of it's based upon God not showing them that. It could be a combination of both. Uh, it's always God not not doing it, obviously, but it's, is it because God's not doing it and, and that's just the way it is, but your heart's in the right place, or is it God's not doing it and you're being arrogant and, and stubborn? And that's a whole different level of it. That's a different. So if God's not doing it, that's a given. The question is, if God's not showing you the truth, are you in the right place to be teachable whether he does or doesn't? That's the point that we have to be at. And some people aren't at that point. He's going to talk about that later on in the book of Hebrews when he talks about being immature. So in chapter 5. But we go into to this chapter 3 when he says, Therefore, holy brethren, again, Adelphoi, Agioi, of the calling. So why are they, what are they medicoi of? Of the heavenly calling. So the medicoi here are those who are medicos, those who are partakers of the fruit of the Spirit, those who are partakers of the fruit of the Spirit, who've been given a heavenly calling invitation, the mikros uh, people, and sperma are now medicoi. You say, well, wait a minute, I thought they were koinonoi at that point in sperma. You're going to find later on, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but i gotta, I got to make sure I put this picture out for you so you can understand this, and I will write this out. So follow the bouncing ball. You're a medicos when you bear the fruit of the Spirit, because you have a hundredfold fruit, you have love and peace and joy, right? So you're a medicos. Then out of those medicos, God will give some of those people the silver of the mina, the understanding of there's more depth behind the Word of God, right? And then when they ever give it, they get a heavenly calling, they get a clego, or they get selected, they get a heavenly calling, and they get this heavenly invitation. These mikros people, and above of sperma, now become seen as metakoi because they're partakers of a heavenly invitation. 
a heavenly calling, right? Then God's going to discipline them. He tells you that later on in chapter 12. When he disciplines them, because you say, well, why are you assuming they're going to be disobedient? Just relax. Every, every one of us is a sinner, so every one of us needs to be disciplined. Okay? It's just the way it works. There's no such thing as you're getting <coughs> scot-free off that hook. There's no, there's no such thing. So because of us all being the need for discipline, because we're sinners, therefore, as a medicoy person, when you're disciplined, therefore, through that suffering, you now become partakers as a medicoy to now be koinonoi, because now you've suffered through the discipline of understanding, and as how the book later on will tell us in chapter 12, you've endured discipline. And because of that, your medicoy heavenly calling has now become real, realized in your life, and now you've become now a koinonoi, because now you've suffered through that discipline of God's correction. And it's about you, you remember it. <laughs> okay, you don't forget that stuff. Yeah. Okay, so the 144,000 that seem medicoy, are none of them are the no, not yet. But they will be in tribulation, but not oh. now. No. But I mean, uh, as of when they are deputized, they, they are not koinoi. Koinoi at that They haven't time. been, that's the whole thing. They haven't been disciplined. Um, they haven't been, they haven't, they've been disciplined, but they haven't responded with endurance to discipline. That's the difference. In Hebrews 12, he talks about they're disciplined, but they don't, they don't endure the discipline. If we endure the discipline, we'll become sons. That's the key phrasing. It's ahead of ourselves. But so all medicoi are disciplined, but not all medicoi endure the discipline. And then when you do, you become a koinonoi. And of course, that, that right there, the, the, the medical part, uh, automatically says sperma. Correct. The oi, yes, correct. Medicos is sporos, medicoi is sperma, which I did not see the de demarcation until this book. Yes, yeah, sorry. My apologies, babe. Yes. Well, Pam said, uh, partakers of the divine nature, the sperma. Are we still seeing chapter 3 being day 7 and chapter 4 being? Yeah, so, yep, 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 yep. So we're still in line with the whole views of the days. The difference is that, um, what's the thing you said before that? Sorry, you said something about, say it again, babe, sorry. Partakers There's of the divine nature? No, not that. So medicoy are not partakers of divine nature. The par partakers of divine nature are the soon koinonoi. That's the, that's the one. So you have to be medicos, medicoy, koinonoi, and then soon koinonoi. And when you're soon koinonoi, then you're partakers of divine nature. Only then. And is, you is that 33 and up? No, no. Corn, no, <laughs> no soon koinonoi is going to be uh, those particularly, it, it could be, uh, well, since, I'm, since the Lord has shown me adjustments on this, I used to think it was potentially could be 30, but the more I'm seeing this, it's probably more going to be um, maybe 60, but definitively the 100, obviously, but it could be 60 as well. I don't think it's 30 anymore of that. I don't think so. Because they're, they're not of the same mindset. The mindset is the difference. Why this says soon is because you're with the same mindset of, of, of wanting to grow in wisdom with the Lord. And the 60 and 100 have that in common. That There's just different levels of wisdom. But they both have that same fullness of understanding, whereas the presumptiveness is among the 30. They're, they're different. They're mature at a lower level. They don't match up. So I don't think they're the included in this. They're kind of in the tweener stage. They're kononoi. They're kononoi and they could be soon koinonoi, but the presumption thing and the 30 versus 60 is a big difference. You see, there, for example, the difference between Elisha and Elijah is the difference. Elisha was way better. He started off where Elijah left off. That gives you a big indicator of, of the difference in maturities. So that's kind of where the difference in the 30 and 60 or difference in a koinonoi and soon koinonoi is. And or I think Elijah's ministry was longer than Elijah's too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, everything was everything was better. Everything was greater. His his maturity starting off, his miracles, his his length of ministry, everything was better. Um, but of course, Elijah had provided the foundation for Elijah. He did. That's correct. It's sort of like a, you know, like the, the grandfather. I mean, you know, as far as the foundation, uh, the hundred, the hundred fruits. I'm mm -hmm. sure that at least he was that, but I don't know that he had any other. The hundred fruits. Yeah, the the foundation was laid, like you said, by Elijah to allow Elisha to kind of on his shoulders start off with a higher maturity. So you don't want to make too much fun or poke a, you know, a finger at Elijah, just like people in our lives who may have blazed the trail before us to be a hundredfold, just because that's all they got to. Be thankful that they gave you the ability because you were standing on their shoulders through God's spiritual provision, put you in a position to start off at a higher maturity than they did. It's because of what they did, you know, because of what God did, I should say, through them collaboratively. So it's that sense of what he's talking about here is, and he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, is everything okay, babe? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. He says, therefore, my ho holy brother and associates of the heavenly calling, uh, attentively regard, or again, 
it, this the word is katanostate, or fully consider, decisively be convicted uh, regarding Jesus. The apostle, we talked about this before, he was the first one sent forth by God and the high priest of the profession. And the profession meaning of the things that are spoken, which is talking about, again, the things spoken, not of his salvation, not of a, he's the high priest of our atonement. That's not what he said. He said that of a profession, which is a homeo lugos, which means of the word spoken, which is speaking to the teaching of our words, he says to, to him, which is the same as us, talking about the actual, it says confession on the right side, we talked about that, but this is about the teaching, uh, the, the wisdom, the, the, the mysteries, the secrets. So he says in verse two, who is faithful to him, who appointed him, which is the word uh, to be made, <laughs> he was made even as Moses was in his house. Meaning, meaning Moses did not start off as the prophet over Israel, did he? No. He was made into that position by God. So God the Father raised up Moses as a prophet unto Israel from humble beginnings, from discarded beginnings, from beginnings that were marked with death of babies. Sound familiar? Just like Jesus, right? No one paid much mind. He was amongst the death of other infants. No one even knew about it until years later. No one ever, no one ever we see recorded said, hey, what happened to that kid anyways in that bull rush on the river? What happened to that kid that survived? No one ever mentioned that. Not, not recorded anyways. Not even in extra biblical information do we find anybody going, hey, hey, uh, uh, what happened to hey, Miriam? What happened to that kid, your, your brother? Is there anything, what, what came of him? No one ever asked until he grew up to this high station in, in, in the Pharaoh's house. And all of a sudden they start to have rumors going around. And then they start hearing about that. And then, of course, he kills the Egyptian. And then he rises up against Pharaoh. And then the rest is history, right? And you have all this other stuff. And that happens where he's 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the desert. And then 40 years later, God takes his life. And he's like, okay. But he's going to get into something in chapter 3, which is very, very interesting. And it is, it is day 7, by the way. But you're going to find out, to preface this, chapter 3, he's about to preface the house of Moses. So it's important to understand what he is talking about. He made Moses over his house. The same way he's saying, I appointed him, Christ, chapter 2, chapter 3, verse 2, excuse me, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, even as Moses was, even as, meaning Christ was made over his house. Why is he pointing that out? What did they do when Moses was made over them? They questioned him. They doubted him. They made accusations. To be specific, they murmured. They lied. And they raised up others to do the same. It's not cool, like at all, right? So that happens today. It happens against me. It happens against anybody who wants to teach the Word of God the way that's against the grain of what the common people think should be the case. Or when they're using worldly parameters in comparison to validate their belief. You know, like Korah and all of them, Dathan, Abiram, and Om were doing. They were saying, hey, at least we had a home back in Egypt. At least we had food. At least we had, at, at least we had. Are you ignorant? Okay, if you follow a spiritual invisible God, should not the physical be the last thing on your mind as what you should focus on when he's delivering you from slavery? I'm just wondering, I, I, what, what is wrong with your brain cells? He's breaking the physical bond to demonstratively show you there's a spiritual bond that you also need to be broken of, and you haven't learned that lesson. Boy, you guys are d dense. You went through a, 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 a body of water. You had a tornado fire hold back Pharaoh. You had a pillar by night, a, f a cloud by day, a rock moving. You fed water from a rock. You complained to give you quail from heaven. It's unbelievable. Manna is dropping down. What, what else do you guys want? It's unbelievable how ignorant they are. And you know that book I gave you, that shorter book, yeah. said you know, of what they complained the least to God was needed. There were six items there, but there were seven items listed by the Lord in the language of six Canaan and their own among the land. Oh, they complained about six, but God listed seven. Is that what you're saying? In, Can in Canaan. But in Canaan. six in the land of Egypt, but there were seven God gave them in their seven. Seven. That's, that's pretty cool. So in this, in, this, in this chapter three, he's going to talk about basically number 16, about the provocation of the provocation, I should say, that they caused upon God. And the reality is people think, well, then, okay, that's, I mean, they weren't ever saved. No, 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 no. He, he, he. <laughs> He's mentioning this to you and me because just like in the house of Moses, as he was made higher up against all his brethren, was that met with absolute and 100% acceptance? Yes or no? No, it was not. Is it not the same with Christ over his household? Is everybody in Christ 100% accepting what the book says? No. 
Because think about what the issue was. The issue was about they questioned his authority. They actually said he was going to be a tyrant and a, and, and a dictator over them. They were putting words in his mouth that weren't true. They didn't like the fact they had to kowtow or answer to how God was speaking through Aaron and Moses. They didn't like that. You know, like it is with us today. Those of us who teach the truth what Scripture says, they don't want to hear that because now they have to submit to a faction of minority of people where the majority says you're full of malarkey. But back then, it really wasn't a majority. We're going to look at it in just a minute. But there was 250, and later on, there's like 14,000 God takes out as well. But there wasn't a ton of people, comparatively speaking. But they were building a groundswell of an insurrection, of rebellion against God, and through his people, Moses and Aaron. And he didn't like that at all. And so here you have him talking about that. He's leading into this when he says in verse 2, who is faithful to him who appoint, who made him. That word made is, that again, in other words, he wasn't that way to begin with, and then he became that way. He was made that way, meaning, as mentioned in chapter 1, Christ as man grew to the place where he obtained, he acquired the heirship. He proved and validated his rightful, uh, his rightful place to be heir over all things, not just of heavenly, but of earthly. He could have done that from a celestial sovereign standpoint, but no. He subjected himself to a frailty of a man. Just to say to you and me, you got any questions? That I'll just validate to you that even in the form of this weekly vessel, I still took claim, the rightful claim, what's mine? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. And so he says, because of what he, who he is and what he has done, there's nothing you could say against him. He hasn't made his rightful claim. He sure has. As king of kings, lord of lords, there's nobody better, right? Only God there is. So verse 3 says, for he has been esteemed, or that is at the word permanently esteemed, because it's written in the permanent tense, he has permanently been esteemed, permanently been esteemed, in a, in a way that is more glory than Moses. He's esteemed more worthy of Moses' glory as of much as the builder has more honor or more value, more worth than the house itself. Now, the word, the word, the builder, the house, the word he's building, the word for building there is katakusas, which means the ongoing, what, what, watch this now, the ongoing specific detail of the house of Moses, was it not detailed? Well, yeah, sure it was. From the dietary law, from the, from the governmental law, to the, the tribal responsibilities, to the priestly responsibilities, to where you would encamp, to how you would interact with each other, to how you were to respect his words, to the 613 commandments that are all lined in therein. There's a lot of detail going on. To how the tabernacle was to be pitched and, un, and, and torn down and put up and set up, and who was to do it, who went first. I mean, the Kohathites, the Munites. And, 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 so you, you can't just sit there and say, oh, it's just, you know, it's just, you know, God just goes half in chance. No, no, no. He's very detailed. So he's saying that same word here, the, the, the kathas kusas, he's making you realize as you're a Jewish person who he's writing to, who's now believing in Christ, he's going, hey, remember the detail and the specific nature of how you had to follow the line when you were in the tribe of this and that and the other? And they're like, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My forefathers told me all about that stuff. Yeah, okay. Well, that's the way it is in God's house with Christ now as the head. Huh? I thought we were free in Christ. I understand. But there's a lot of details. He's telling them in his house the same detailed principles exist. The same order of things exists. And now all of a sudden, their eyes are like, what'd you just say? He's like, uh, yeah. Think about what I am saying to you. First of all, Moses was made over his brethren. Was it accepted widely? No. The, was he, was he, does he himself, did he himself exalt his way to that throne? No, he was made that way. Did, and differently, Christ did obtain and acquire it. But just like with Moses, God the Father imputed to him a name above all names and gave all authority to him, right? That's what they have in common. The Father imputed that unto Moses, just like he imputed that unto God the Son. But there was details in that house, and just like in Christ's house. But the difference is, it's way ongoingly more worthy of esteem and more value than the house of Moses, is what verse 3 is saying. Then in verse 4, he says, For every house is built by, by someone, but he having built all things is God. The same words used again for built. He who ongoingly put the details in place is none other than God himself. So God himself is the one who puts every detail in your life. Every detail. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. I don't want you to want to phrase it as. It doesn't matter how you want to see it. I remember uh, long ago I was looking to talk to a person about the sovereignty of God. A person who believed in kingdom things. A person who believed 
the difference between salvation and inheritance, and they understood some kingdom things. And, and I said to them, you do realize that every detail is ordained by God. And he said, and there's an older man in his, in his 60s, and he knew kingdom for about, I don't know, say 20 years. And he said, no, his own words, paraphrase, God does not care about birds and germs. And I go, okay, his words. And I said, wait, wait, so think what you're saying. So you're telling me that one bird has a, to your point, has a germ that gets in that bird, and that bird gets sick, affects other birds, and those birds don't do certain things that then provide the ec ecological cycle that all affect crops and other things, and, and all of a sudden that affects man, and God just goes, I wasn't really caring about that. No, I'm good. Really? You actually think God just puts like an auto set, autopilot on nature? And he says, yes. <laughs> wow. So you think God just sets auto on, on just the details. He said not to, God doesn't care about those fine-tuned fine things. The fine-tuned things are what make us into the whole. Do you, do you realize that, right? That makes no sense what you're saying. Then why would he, why would he say all, why would he have, why would he make the statement that not one jot or tittle, not one tiniest thing will go away from my word if he doesn't care about details? That the smallest thing will, will fade, he said. The flower and grass may fade, but not my word. Not until all things are fulfilled. I'm telling you, it ain't going to happen. So why would he put such much pride and statement into every detail of what he says, which, by the way, wait a minute, he spoke and all things came into existence. Doesn't that validate what I'm saying? That he said every word matters, it won't every jot and tittle, and he, all things came into existence by his word. Therefore, his creation, all that we see, is on the revenant, the premise of what he had spoken to existence. Therefore, it's all detailed, which matters to him. So I don't understand how you can say details don't matter, but people say that because they don't want to go into that conversation because when they do, it leads them down the sovereignty path. When they're free willers, they don't like that. They don't like that at all because that just makes them feel uncomfortable. So well, here... Well, the very hairs on your head are numbered. That's detailed. Oh, it is. <laughs> right, I know. And Because they, they, they grow and they fall out, right? Hairs on your head and he has them all numbered. So here, here and God, you know, plans, man may plan his steps, but I mean, how, a man may have his, how does it say in the Proverbs? Man may plan his steps, but God marks out his path or something like that. I can't remember how the phrasing goes. I should remember this. But in verse 5, he said, And Moses indeed was faithful in his whole, his whole uh, house as a servant for a testimony of the things to be spoken. Now here he's talking about Moses being a servant, and the word for servant there is therapon, which means he was a willing servant continually. So a therapon is a willing servant. It's written in the plural, meaning he was willingly, consistently that way, which is now you know why he and Abraham had that distinctive uh, adjective of being called a friend of God. It's pretty awesome, right? Well, you can see why. When you're a willing servant to constantly, continually be there at the bequest of what God wants of you, that's, that's going to please him. How could it not, right? So he's saying here in verse, uh, again, verse 2, he was made that way, Christ. 3, that he is the one who's detailed and his house and it's more gloriful, more glory, more honorable, more value than the house of Moses by far. God's in control of all the details, verse 4. In verse 5, Moses was in his whole house an ongoing, willing servant. But he was doing it for what reason? For himself? For the people? No. For a testimony of the things to be spoken. He was doing that to show you how Christ himself would do nothing, as he said, apart from the Father, but also to show us how we're to conduct ourselves in a house of servitude to be willing servants constantly at the bequest of, what do you want from me, Father? What do you need from me, Father? What do you require of me, Father? Not the other way around. Can Moses just run buckshot and do what he wants? No, he cannot do that. He had to still, he was the high guy in charge, and he was given lots of wisdom and accountability, but he had to do what God said. Yes? God said a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Thank Proverbs you. Proverbs 16, 9. There you go. There you go. I love it. Thank you. Proverbs 16, 9. Thank you for that, Brother Todd. I appreciate that. So, uh, memory's not the best sometimes. I remember everything. People always say, boy, you remember stuff. Well, I don't remember everything, right? So, thank, thank you for bringing that out. So, so, here's Christ being talked about by Moses because he says Moses was this, the reason he was the willing servant, the therapon, continually willing servant, was not for the people's benefit. It was to be a testimony of the things to be spoken. It says, into. He was that way. Look at the left side of your margin. And Moses, indeed faithful in the whole of the house of him, as a servant, into a testimony. So the, because he was doing that, in other words, his ability to continue, God was using, 
his collaborative relationship with Moses to allow him to be a willing, willing willful servant, constantly get to serve God, and by doing so, it led into, in other words, it validated more of what God was going to say later about us and about Christ himself, that he too was a willing servant into the fulfillment of God's word in his life, which would lead us to understand as he's the example how we are to lead the same way, or follow, I say, the same way he led by example to continue to be willful servants continuously. But Christ, he says in verse 6, as I sung over his house, over his, his house, he says, of whose house we are. Now the we is the, is the himis. Yes. A martyr, that's correct. That's correct. So the, the martyr, that's right, that's the word for testimony. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't emphasize that, but yes, the same phrasing used in the book of Acts, you shall be my witnesses, my martyrs. You will, you will live as a faithful, in other words, paraphrase, you will be a there upon a willing servant, and you'll do it continually until I take your life. What? You heard me. I'm like, good gracious. So into the life itself coming to an end. So. So that means that even Mo that's why Moses is coming back in the tribulation period. People think, well, how can, how, can he be, how can he be a willing servant into a martyrdom unto death before God? But we know he ended his life kind of on a bad note, on a sour note, because God's not done with him yet. He's going to come back and continue that willful servant, all save the issue he had with God when he did that was wrong. But God's going to make that right with him. So here in verse 6, oh Christ as a son of his house, whose house we are, and the Hemi, and, and the and the himis, which is us who are in the mature one status, the general speaking of this, he says, if we are of the Christ's house, now remember, in every other commentary, they're going to say, oh, you're all of Christ's house when you come into Christ. When you come believe Christ as your Savior, and no, some even go, the Lordship of Salvation people will go as far as to say, when he's your Savior, Lord, or Lord, Savior, they put it together as one word. There's two words, dude. You can't say that. But by the way, they're consistent. They think spirit and soul is the same thing. Do they think Lord Savior is the same thing? But it's two different words. They go, doesn't matter, same thing. But, but, it, but, but, but it's two different words. Doesn't matter, same thing. Okay, okay, whatever, man. So they're, they're just like that. So that's fine. So here you have, here he says, if we should hold, we are of Christ's house, verse 6, if, which is conditional, if we hold fast the confidence and the exaltation of the hope. Let's talk about this. What is the hope? Hope, elpis, is hope of inheriting of the earth. And the hope, when the the is a part of it, so hope deals with inheritance, bottom line, okay? Hope deals with inheritance. When you see an article in front of the hope, or the hope, is, which is the hope, it's speaking of the hope that's in the heavenly. Because again, what would you rather have? In Moses' house, there was the earthly inheritance of the 11 tribes, and of the 12th tribe of the Levites, they were actually given a heavenly inheritance of God himself. What would you rather have? Well, so there's hope. They all have an inheritance. And there's the hope. There's the heavenly inheritance specific to God himself, which we would say is the divine nature, which you don't get to have the hope until day eight. But in order to have been positioned for the hope, you must live up to the heavenly calling to enter into day seven, Ariston, Melody Feast. Preparatory for that. Yes. What's the exaltation? I'm going to get there right now. So the exaltation, is you're on that, since you're on that word, it's the koshima. It means a rejoicing as the result of. Rejoicing as the result of what? It didn't just say rejoicing. It's interesting the word, the suffix ma is at the end of it. Look at it yourself. There's a word, you could, he, could, he could have just said kachima. He said koche. No, he said kachima. Why do you say kachima for? Because he means as a result. You're joyful as a result of what? You're boasting as a result of what? Of God's love and provision in your life. Because you're realizing the depth of God's love and how deep it really goes, just not just, not just the level of him saving you away from your sins, but providing you the insight to the mysteries and the secrets of who he is and what he's written. That's pretty profound. So as a result of that, you have more joy. You're not just joyful because God loves you. You're more so joyful as a result of how he has loved you, the specific nature of how he has provided for you. Because you get it. We get it more than most people. Because most people, for example, will say, Christ died for my sins, and I'm joyful for that. And I have a God of, I am boasting in that God loves me. And then they, but, but, if you, <laughs> but if you realized 
if you realize that a small faction of people amongst the masses that he has brought into under his blood, we able to live with him forever and forever on. There's only a few that get to be with the close proximity, and he's invited you and me to be in a position to do that. As a result of that, it makes it a little more joyful <laughs> and knowing that same God who saved us from sin and death is the same God who's given us the greatest life opportunity ahead of us that's ever been known. It's, it's unbelievable. Well, it hasn't been known yet, but it will be, right? And so the reality is, is that when he says the confidence, the word confidence here is the word perishion, which is to have a confident, bold resolve. So we only have our Christ. So rephrase it. We're only of Christ's house if, if we hold if we hold fast, which is really to take hold of it really tightly, the two things he said. You just put on one of them, the kachima. If we are, we are overly joyed about the hope he's been given to us. He gave us a chance to have an to airship in the heavens. That's insane. And only a few get to have that even opportunity. He's given that to you and me. So if you hold fast to that and... And you position yourself to be confidently bold, to be, I'm going to have not just confidence, I'm going to have the perishion. I'm going to have the emphatic boldness and confidence in what God has given me and who I know he is. I'm not going to lose it. Nothing's going to shake me from that. No physical ailments, mental, emotional, financial, whatever it is. No challenge is too big that I'm going to be cowered away from what I've been known, been shown to me in my heart and spirit to be true. I'm not, it's not going to happen. I always make it a... People at work will say to me, you know, they'll, they'll make a phrase and they'll funny, and they'll say, oh, you're just resilient. And I'll say, well, the thing is with me, if I was, if you would have put a word picture around me, if those little things you see, those little posters, I, I'd say you put resilient. I would say that, that that's me. Meaning, I may not have success all the time, I may not have the best response all the time, but I don't quit. And, and you could bludgeon me and beat me, and I say, I'm like that little rocky word picture of that boxer. My eyes may be shut and swollen, and I may have broken ribs, and I have blood on my mouth, but until you knock me the heck out or kill me, I'm going to get back up again and come at you. That's just who I am. That's just who I am. I do that in, in a more metaphorical sense, spiritually. I've, I've, been going, I've gone through things in my life personally, individually, in a marital life where it's been challenging physically, financially, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all that stuff. And I just keep on moving forward. I, to me, it's like the Job thing. What other choice do I have? I, I, that's where my mindset comes from. Okay, what choice do I have? What, to get angry at God? What's that going to do? That's not smart. The angry at myself, which I do for moments, but long term, what's that going to do? Angry at other people, what's that going to do? So my mindset's always, I go through that cycle, don't get me wrong, but it ends up with the same place, which is get up and get moving. I just, and I, I just, I just go. And then in some way, somehow, God just works it out all the time, right? He just always does. And I just got to keep myself in that place. So when he says have goal, have, have confidence, resolve, and that the perizon, he's talking about not just any kind of boldness and confidence, the kind that comes from knowing who he is, who he's made you, and what he's promised you out ahead. So to have resolve in life is one thing, but to have resolve knowing that the stakes are high is quite another. And that's what he's talking about. The stakes are the highest they could possibly be. Have the kind of resolve that your holy life depends on it. Holy, as in W-H-O-L-L-Y. Your whole life depends on it. Your spiritual outcome depends on it. It's not funny. It's true. Your spiritual outcome depends on you being resilient. It's not a joke. It's a fact. So he says, this is, and if we do that, <laughs> we belong to the house of Christ. Wait a second, man. I, I, I was told by commentaries, well, okay, Jesus lives and he dies. Then I believe in him. He's my savior. I'm in his house. That, that's what I was told. But no, you, everybody's told that, right? But how do they explain this? Now you see why they have to be Lordship Salvation orientated. They have to force works into saying, well, then um, it can't be something that we have to do as an accountability issue. Um, let me see what it might, it must mean. Okay, it must mean that we all will have a sense of, of joy in God and we're so confident that, that I know he loves me. That's what you get from that? Yes, that's all they get from that. The hope is, the hope is, is, is that is, is heaven. Uh, the joy is God loves me, and the confidence is knowing He's never, never going to stop loving me, and that's all they believe. To, to, they miss so much because they refused to believe that the book was written to number one, the people of God, number two, not just any people of God, but mature ones in a position to enter with a view to inheritance, and that is what the focus of the book is. 
There's going to be some overlap where you might get some principles of some, some things in there that might be nice for you to hear and apply to your life. Doesn't mean you got the truth out of it. Uh, I remember, I, I, the best way I can explain this, I remember when I was in shop class, I was not a mechanical person in high school at all. And my dad was a makeshift guy being raised from poor. We mowed lawns. So guess what he did to a lawnmower? It didn't work. He put a, 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 a Toro, I think it was a Toro uh, engine casing over like a lawn boy engine. So I, I didn't know you could even do that, but he just kind of he kind of was like beating the heck out of it, and he was able to replace parts just to get things to run. And why is that important to know? Because part of the class, the entire semester's class grade was based on bring a lawnmower engine, it doesn't work, take it apart, and make it run. If it does, you pass. Well, I brought in a Toro engine, so I thought. But it wasn't. It was a lawn boy engine <coughs> on a Toro cover. So he gives me a Toro handbook, right? And now everybody else gets the handbook based on the engine they bring in. So the teacher's right there trying to help you. The, 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 the book based upon the model and make of what it is. Start taking it apart. We're into like maybe week six, six. All of a sudden, I take it apart. You take it out a little piece at a time as we're learning from the test grades. And then you go through. It's kind of combining the mechanical with the actual word reading and all this stuff. Get to the part where I'm taking it apart back in week six, I think it was. And I see... Like in, in like in Boston side in grave it says lawn boy and I'm like what because I couldn't figure out something didn't match up on the book to the engine and the teacher comes over and says you got to start over from scratch everything's wrong you got to do it over from with the lawn boy now so what's my point of that story the point is but 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 at first it seemed like I was for six weeks I was checking off all the boxes everybody else in the class we were in teams of two we were all on the same progressional chart we were all doing the same things. Uh, take this apart, check, do this, check, 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 until it got to the part where it veered off to be different. Only then did I realize, oh gosh, um, something's not matching up. Then I looked closely and saw the different word, it said lawn boy, and it wasn't a Toro, and I was like, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. And I was just frustrated as I'll get out. And I got a C on that class. My first C I ever got in my life was in that class. I don't ever forget it. And that was why. Because I, I, I started with the wrong premise. But the wrong premise did not reveal itself until weeks later. Because there were similarities of how I was able to apply a different, a different specific detail was different totally. Toro engine, that's the same as the Lombo engine. But I was able to apply the general overlay of common thread. I was able to apply that for about six weeks until the specific detail caused me to go awry. Now, let's just say I didn't change at that point and go to the Lombo manual. Let's say I tried to force the, the, the Toro uh, handbook onto a lawn boy mechanical piece uh, of, of fixing it. It wouldn't have worked. But I would have been in denial, wouldn't I? I would have been like, well, the book is wrong. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have accepted it, right? I mean, because humans are like that, right? The same holds true for God's word. People will take what they want out of the verse because there is some common understanding that can overlap between what the truth really is saying versus what you want it to say. But there comes a place where there's a fork in the road where the details will reveal to you it's not that way at all. And you got a choice to make. Start over, right? Or push forward and be in denial that you can't possibly be wrong. Unfortunately, the latter is what most people do. And that's why they don't understand Hebrews. They continue to push forward because they don't want to believe what the word is saying that they have to start over again, even though they know the impasse of the common things they had in common for a while, what they're thinking, what they're reading, all of a sudden it comes to a place like right here, they're going, okay, wait a minute. Salvation of my grace through faith. But I, that makes me in the house of Christ, but yet he's clearly an action of work here. I have to do things to be in the house of Christ? That does not speak to salvation by grace through faith. Even if you are going to say it's just love and confidence in God's love, why do I have to do that to be in his house if he put me there by grace through faith? I'm confused. They don't want to address that issue. They just skirt right over it and move on, just like I was doing with the Toro lawn boy issue. I didn't know until it was forced for me to know because it wouldn't. I, I couldn't actually go pa past that point. And so here in verse 7, he says, Therefore, because of this, of, of this confident resolve we have to have because of the high stakes, because of the, the kachima, the rejoicing we have because of God's love and provision, because of the hope of the heavenly inheritance. Therefore, he's telling you because of the high stakes, because of the high stakes of what we've been given and who it is that we're looking to be having close... <laughs> intimacy with is Christ himself, as the Holy Spirit says, verse 7, today if you will hear his voice. Now, here we go. And the word there for, therefore is, is like, it's the word for dio, or, or through this, or through as says the Spirit, 
Today, if you shall hear, if you hear his voice. He says this a couple times later on as well. So he's talking about hear his voice. Remember what, remember what, wait, wait. Go back to John 10 for a minute. Look at this. Go back to John 10 for a minute. And, and look what John 10, what Jesus said, and what they know, because they were told before that they should be listening to Christ. If they believed him, they be, if they believed Moses, they believed him. He wrote of them. But here in chapter 10 of, of John, he says, Jesus answered in verse 25, I told you you did not believe the works which I did in my Father's name. They testified to me. But you do not believe me because you are not of, you're not of my sheep, my probaton. My sheep, my probaton, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I will give them aeonian in life, and they shall by no means perish to the age. This is John 10, verse 25 through 28. And so here we have him saying, if you will hear the voice. How can you hear the voice unless you're in a position? You can't be a little lamb because you're, you're following other sheep. You have to be of the probata, probaton status. In this case, he's saying, look, you have to, you're in this position where you are so to hear, and you better pay attention. That's why he starts off with pay attention, right? Look closely at Jesus because he, he has the sheep. He's saying, sheep, attention. The shepherd's calling you. But yes, 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 I, I'm listening. <laughs> so that's what he's trying to tell you. Yes. Yeah, well, in, in this case, um, no. so no, not reserved for faithful ones. When he says the Spirit, it's interesting you're saying that. That's a, that's a good point. So when he's saying the Spirit, the Holy, because there are times, to your point, where um, the Holy Spirit is referenced in different ways. I'm, I'm trying to find patterns for that and how that would be used, because your great point you're bringing out is the article the is actually sometimes emphasized for the Spirit of God and the Holy, the Spirit. I'm having a, I'm having a hard time myself trying to differentiate how what's used where. But it does bring up a different sense of his paraclete nature. So it's bringing up that he's, he's always the paraclete, right? Comes alongside of us. But when he's referenced as the Holy, the Spirit, in this case, that's what it's saying here. The, it says in verse 7, uh, the Spirit, the tonuma to o agion, so agios. So yeah, you do have him being emphasized here as not just the paraclete, not just a paraclete, but the paraclete. In other words, He's the tutor behind the mysteries and the secrets more so than ever. He's closer to you than, it's just like, uh, again, um, I, 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 another analogy, again, is that it's like when, you, when you're in school and you, and you have a, uh, when I first learned about algebra, it's different, but when you get to trigonometry, you need a lot more focused attention because it's that on steroids. So you can't just like take the same approach. So because of the dynamics of the, of the material, the teacher will be more attentive to you, right? Because they understand the gravity of the materials better, is, is, is more, they expect you to be a student is on there for a reason, but they're always gonna be clemency that I would think, right? Because you know the material's more dynamic, therefore you're gonna take more, uh, more, more of a feel for how your class is doing on the material, taking it in, yes. The setup's usually at the higher level, but the resolution is usually at the lower level. You do your trig equations, you, you set up at your higher level knowing that the trig information Interesting. So the setup is the higher level, and, there, and the seclusion is the lower level. So you use your higher level information to build the structure, and the lower level information to get the result. You're saying, right? Yes, that's coming from you, a math teacher. That means a lot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, babe. And then you're seeing this as higher up than before. So is this manifestation of the Spirit leading these into yeah. those faithful yeah. positions? Perhaps? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. So yep. Yeah. So I'm saying to you that I'm I'm not I'm not. Um, it's the same, so the Holy Spirit can work with people of sporos and osporma. What I'm saying is that when the emphasis of the Holy, the Spirit, to your point, is being used, he's, he's the one who's helping to what Nancy just said in like in a math professor standpoint. The trigonometry sets the framework from which to understand the, the problem. But then when you go to the, get to the bottom line, the resolution is using your algebraic skills that were more basic than what you understood to get the framework. You said that right? Okay, so so the same rules here. So the Holy Spirit is is the Holy. The Spirit is bringing out his his closer, endearing teacher counseling role to you at this level because he has to put in the intricacies, the details of the house of Christ, from which to have you understand what you're hearing, how it fits in to what you already know to be true in your basic understandings of principles you've learned along the way. He's there to help build the structure of the house 
So yeah, I do believe that when he's emphasizing the Holy of the Spirit, it's the same Holy Spirit. The difference is his role is more dynamic. It's more specific. He's more endearing because of the material being so much more gravitas, so much more detailed. That sounds more like in a physical situation, somebody seeing from a, from a high level. They see from a high level there's, that there's more skill getting from that high level to a certain point, and then at a certain point, it starts leveling off, and you're like, oh, now I can just, not exactly close. I mean, you've got to pay attention, yeah. but it, it doesn't require good. as much skill after a certain yeah. point. So you just you're right. Yeah, so in skiing, it takes more skill to know how to take off from that higher slope and navigate through. But once you get that flow going, you're going back to your basic tenants you already had to ski in general to get yeah, the rest it, of it. It's not, not so much like sliding on a home plate, but I mean, you know, after a certain point, going down here, you go, okay, now yeah. I, 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 I know what you mean. You glide. Yeah, you kind of. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, babe. Ben said, I see that, yes. There's a measure of assimilation, too. Oh, yeah, no doubt, right? So here in verse 8, then he says the interesting thing, which is I, I've never seen this before, and I think it's really telling. When I saw this, I got chills uh, because he says, harden not your hearts as in the bitter provocation. Now, what did I get chills about? Well, the bitter, the bitter provocation is when the word is, para procrastinos, which means para alongside procrastinos, the irritation that you cause God from your rebellion. So God was, <laughs> so because of your rebellion, God was irritated. So in other words, the irritation and rebellion are inseparable. Hence, we get the word provocation. So provocation is a word that means because of our rebellion, God says my irritation is forever linked to that rebellion, and I detest it. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Yes, Father. I get that clearly. Good gracious. That's a pretty demonstrative statement he's making, that our rebellion is forever linked to his irritation of that rebellion, because how dare we do such a thing after all he's given and done for us? That is, that is, that's not the point that gave me chills. It's the other point. Yes? Yeah, I mean, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, and I think it's Galatians 5, 6, and yeah, 4. Yeah. You know, not to have the vain glory, to provoke one another, envying one another. Oh. That's right. Don't provoke your kids. Don't provoke each other. And it's all about don't be rebellious so that then the irritation of the other, one does the rebellious act, one, one then gets irritated, and it's forever linked now. Their irritation is linked to your rebellion. Your rebellion now causes their irritation, and you can't, you can't, it, they're, they're un, you can't untwine them. It's you like almost wondered if those who provoke are those who anger. Well, kind of. Well, this, in this case, they were just, he's going to say they were hard-hearted. I'll tell you what. Yeah, sorry, babe. Yeah. Paul said, but God permitted that to happen before time. Yep. Not, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say the word permitted. I would say ordained. He God ordained it to happen. He collaboratively uh, chose to show them and reveal to them that they chose not to collaborate with him in their own mindset in time and place with and their thoughts and their, correct. with their thoughts and their emotions. They chose not to collaborate with him even though before time he ordained it to show us that our collaborative um, desire is not to do what is right by him. And he wants us to, see, to show that his ordained will was to reveal to us as sinners, we don't measure up. So someone would say, why would he do that? Why would he not make us succeed? Because sinners never succeed. We only succeed when God lets us. That's the whole point. You don't, you don't believe that? Try on your, take, to take, go and make a prayer to God and say, God, help me succeed without you. See how far you get with that. <laughs> how, 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 how? How are you going to succeed without him? That's why he ordains sins in our lives. So that to show you without him, that's all you can ever do is sin. That's all you can ever do is experience failure after failure after failure from one to the next. You can placate it all you want into how you feel good and how it makes you think good. It doesn't matter. It's a veneered lie. You are a constant failure to failure person when you're living in sin, that's all you do, is you go from one failure to the next failure. That's all you do. You can lie to yourself and not say that's not true, but that's what's going on. And so when God's intervening, he goes, well, now you're just experiencing failures, hopefully less of them, on your path to a success that I'm leading you down spiritually. That's the difference with him in your life. When you collaborate with him, that's the difference. The failures are still there. The difference is the gravity of them is less, the frequency of them should be less, and thirdly, they lead to an ultimate success. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. Whereas the other ones are more frequent, more gravitas, and they lead to nothing but just ultimate failure, which would suck. If that's what you want to die in your own sins, that's not good. So, so that, that's what he's talking about. So here, when he says, harden not your hearts, the word harden is 
It's, it's the word I'm going to pronounce it out for you. Scary, <laughs> scare, scarely, scarely optic. I can't even say it. But basically, it means to be dried out. To be dried out. To be stiff-necked. So think about something. Dried out. Right away, the first thought came to my mind is the Word of God. The water of God's Word. Jesus said, you thirst, you take of me, you'll have living water, you'll never be thirsty again. So a hardening of the heart is a direct connection to two things, the lack of desire to know God and the lack of God's word in your own mind and heart and spirit. That is pretty sad. So that's why you have this place of rebellion. So rebellious people have, have those two things in common. Anybody who knows who Jesus is and has his blood covered them from their sins is, is their child forevermore. But here's the question. He's not talking about just them. He's talking about, do you know somebody who knows who God is at a deeper level, as in like us, who would then get dried up from their desire for God? And they get dried up from the word of God being in their life. They kind of just don't remember much and don't even choose to think it's important anymore. He says, you don't, you don't understand. That's going to lead you to be rebellious. That's going to lead you to irritate me, which I call provocation, which is equal to disinheritance forever. I'm never going to make you an heir. It's never going to happen. Not at this level. You get to this level, and you dry up, and you're desiring for him and his word in your life. The living and written word both are just have dried up, become parched. Well, that no wonder you're stubborn. No wonder you become rebellious. Oh, you're going to get what's coming to you, the provocation, which means disinheritance forevermore. I'm not changing my mind about it either. Like he said later on about Esau and Jacob. There's no change in mind in me, Jack. I'll be nice to you, but you're never going to inherit. Not going to happen. Yes? Remember, as Samuel says, stubbornness is uh, idolatry and the rebellion of the Philistines. Yeah. 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 He talks about, yeah, he talks about you, your disobedience is like witchcraft. He does say that. It's interesting. Yep. Yes? Vicki said, what was the second one? This is a repeat message from Psalm 95 about the trials in the wilderness. Yep. So this is, the, this is the repeat. So this is what he's talking about. He's talking about the trial in the wilderness. But he said, here's the difference, though. Here's the difference. The word trial there, look what it says for trial. But you brought that up, too. We're in that part of the verse. So harden not your hearts. You don't become dried out. And, and fle By the way, when you're dried out, when something's more, when something's more liquid and more um, satiated, it's more flexible. When it's dried out, it's stiff. It's inflexible, which is code for unteachable stubborn, slow to hear, thick-skulled, self-absorbed. You put all the adjectives you want in there. That's what happens to someone who gets hardened. Let's get to, well, we'll get, we'll get to your point in just a minute. So when you're hardened, you're dried out. You're dried out from desire for God, from the Word of God in your life. So what happens, you become more inflexible. You become less and less teachable because your mind's all made up with the facts. God and His Word have no more place in your life. Now, people might say, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, remember, remember, remember now, he's not talking about people that said, now, <laughs> Korah, Datham, and Beerim and on. Here's the question for you. Did they want to worship false gods? <coughs> no. They did not. Not true. Not true. They wanted to take ownership of the leadership of the people. They wanted to usurp Moses and Aaron. That's what they wanted. D just understand that. They did not want to say, God's not our God. That's not what they said. Don't, don't put words in their mouth. So people think that they take this verse and they go, oh, oh, the desire for God that makes you dry up and the lack of having God's word in your life means that you just don't want God in your life. No, 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 no. It's because you want to desire God the way you want to desire God, not the way he tells you to. And you want to have God's word fit your agenda, not you fit God's agenda. That's what he's talking about. Hello. Yeah, you get inflexible when you get unteachable because you don't want to see yourself as a subject to worship God the way he demands and to have God's word be, be not subject to your thoughts, uh-uh, all the way around. You're subjected to it. But unfortunately, denominationalism and doctrinal belief systems force you to believe the way they tell you to. So then you subject the scripture to your framework of thought. And that is being stiff-necked. And you're drawing out God's word because you're, you're basically, you're, 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 <laughs> you're tightening, it's like putting a kink in the hose. The water's on, but you keep going, I'm good with a little drip. <laughs> He's like, you don't understand what you're doing. You're really irritating me right now. 
that was not, the purpose of the flow was for me to be living water, to flow in your life, and you're not letting that happen. And wherever that leads you is where it leads you, but you're never gonna find that out when you put, keep putting kinks in the hose. And that is not good with him. He does not sit well with that at all. Yes. And Pam said, like leather that's not conditioned yeah. periodically. Yep, it gets so dried hard out. And unusable. So think about that imagery of leather or anything that requires to be, you know, moisture in it and it gets dried out and how much inflexible and it breaks. Easy, doesn't it? It breaks. Sometimes it just breaks in half. It's brittle and it breaks after a while, right? So it needs to have moisture, in which is our heart, our spirit needs the constant moisture of God's word. And he says, and the day of the trial. And the, the trial, it's the parasmos, which is singular, but it's actually tol parasmos, which he's talking about the, the singular test of faith. So what was the test of faith? It was Numbers 13. Which, which led to number 16. Numbers 13 was when the spy said, we got this, man. We got this. This land is ours. This land is our land. This land is your land. Our God has provided to squash those giants. <laughs> and they're like, no, we can't. We're grasshoppers. And he's like, hogwash. And so that was chapter 13. Chapter 16 then became that became the impetus, their lack of belief, their faith in God's word. I will lead you to Canaan. I'm going to be your God. I will provide for you. They go, no, no, you won't. Not. You mean like in ways that we can see and understand. You mean as long as it fits my mindset, as long as it fits what I believe can be possible, as long as it fits my agenda. N no, I, I never said that. I'm just telling you I'm going to provide for you a land I told you about and it doesn't have to fit your agenda, your mindset, or what you believe or think is true or not. If I said it, you believe it, that settles it. This is not a conversation. But they go, uh, no, those are big, huge dudes over there. And by the way, uh, according to Stephen Quayles in his book, uh, it's more than just 14-foot people. He believed there could have been like 30-foot people, which is pretty wildly crazy. And you can see why they would say grasshoppers, because if you're 30-foot and I'm only this, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I might just very well say when you're five times my size, I'm a grasshopper. Uh, I'm just saying. I can see the comment. So if that's true, I don't know that, but it's a, he has a lot of evidence why he believes that, and it's really interesting because I read that book that you gave, The Giants. It's unbelievable. So, okay, so if that being true, and by the way, one of the things he points out about that is, in which I think was really compelling, is this, this there's a stone, um, I can't remember the actual everything. I think somewhere, I think it's Peru or South America, where there's like a stone um, city of this uh, uh, imagery that when it was built was a time when we didn't have flight and all that stuff. And so he was saying there's no tree tall enough. You couldn't have seen the imagery of what they built unless you were thousands of feet in the air, unless the angle that you had was at least so much in the air, which was taller than a tree. So how could you have built that unless you were, your perspective was to see it because you were tall, because you were a giant. And I'm like, Okay, interesting. So, because they, they built it with such precision, this imagery of what they did, right? So, but the, the interesting part about this here, going back to this is, they're not, they didn't believe in God's provision to give them the promised land of their inheritance, right? Of their physical inheritance. So God has them wander in the wilderness later on. But here we have chapter 13 about that. And then chapter 16, you have this usurpation upon Moses. Let me read to you uh, in chapter 16, if you go there, since we're on this topic, so go to chapter 16, and you're going to read the heart and soul of what they did in their provocation, what the trial was, was their lack of faith, which resulted in, so the test was, you're going to believe me or not? You're going, to, you're going to go by what you think, what you believe, or go by what I said and what I told you to do? I, t I said I was going to do this, I told you to go, go to the land, go get them. And so they, a couple chapters later, result in this comment, that they say, and we'll read a couple verses here from verses 10 through 14 of Numbers 16. It says, He hath indeed brought thee near and all the brethren to the children of Levi with you, and did you seek in this manner to officiate also as priest? This is Moses saying to Korah. And verse 11, You and all your company who are tumultuously assembled before God, as for Aaron, who is he that you murmur against him? Then Moses sent to Dathan and Abiram and sons of Elah, and they said, We're, We will not go up. It is a small matter that thou hast bringing us up to a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, that you would tyrant, that you would be a tyrant over us. You are a chief. 
And then he, and then he went on. So I, I'm just letting you know that they are murmuring, they are telling lies, and they are leading a coup to go against Moses and Aaron. And later on, when God opens up the earth and destroys and then has the fire, in verse 36, there was 250 men. And later on in verse 49, he says, oh, not to be outdone, there was a play to come to some to other people at the altars of the, at the incense of the fire. And he says, now they who died by the plague were 14,700. Uh, yeah, so just that 15,000 people uh, on the count of Korah were, were drop dead Fred. Yeah, he, he's not playing around, right? And so here when he's talking about the provocation and the trial, the trial was, the trial was, are you going to believe me or not? You just heard them mention their usurpation against Moses and Aaron was because of the land flowing milk and honey. They're like, I'm not going there. You're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. The sea was enough. The whole thing was enough. I've had enough of this. Enough of what? God providing miracles and provisions no matter what your eyes see and tell you? I don't understand. What's wrong with you? It's just so stupid, right? It's so crazy. It's just like someone who says, I've had enough of these mysteries and, and secret stuff. I've had enough of the Greek says this, or that word means something different than what I was told all my life, or, or the King James isn't, isn't alone by itself, the best version, or, or my denomination isn't got it right, or there's more to heaven than just dying and going in on, on a cloud playing a harp. I had enough. Have you now? Oh, okay. You're going to tell God what you want him to be, and you're going to tell him what you want his word to say. You're not going to just go with the flow and have him be who he's showing you he is and let him teach you what his word says. That's not good enough for you. You go, no. Uh, I know who he is. Don't don't de redefine him. And I don't I know what his word says. Stop adding things that may confuse me. Uh, okay, that's not good, like at all, because that was the trial. The, fa the you remember what faith is, believing God at His word. Matthew eight, the centurion soldier, when he said, "Just say it, Lord, and my servant's healed." He says, "I can go there." No, 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 no. I'm a soldier who commands many. I say it, and they go. You are the master of your creator. You just say he's healed, and I believe it. And Jesus said, I've seen no greater faith than all of Israel amongst this Gentile Roman soldier. So here you have the Roman centurion. You have the faith is the test. So the test was the faith in God's word. Would you trust him and his word? Just that. And they didn't do that. And it led to their later on murmuring, lies, and insurrection they were having against Moses and Aaron. He says, where your fathers, verse 9, the trial in the desert, where your fathers tried, where your fathers tried, having been tried. So this is, uh, this is crazy. Your fathers tried, proved, and saw my works 40 years. So when it says that they, they proved, uh, yeah, it means that they doki masia. That means um, through a test, they saw. In other words, through the test of the faith and their reaction to it being ignorant, they saw the results. So they tried to prove me. Well, they, they saw where that led them. Yeah, 40 years of wandering around until they all dropped dead. Yeah, that's not fun, is it? No fun, sir. Not at all. Well, that, uh, I, all you had to do is believe me and my words. All you had to do. That's all you had to do. It's not that hard. Well, it is when your eyes tell you something else. It is when your mindset's telling you something else. It is when you have to swallow your pride and like I did in the Toro Lombo example, you have to restart your entire thinking of understanding who God is all over again. That's hard to do. But it's not hard to do when it comes to what's at stake. When, the, when he says, the, what do you call it? The parision, the confidence at stake and the exaltations at stake, the hope that's at stake. When you have that at stake, that's not asking that much. I'll redo, all, I'll redo the whole test over again. You're, it's, like you, it's like you're a math professor and I have, I have at stake a, a summa cum laude graduation and the ability to be in the best place where I can have the cure to heal all illnesses or autoimmune diseases. You're going to give me the keys to the, to, the, to the understanding how to heal all autoimmune diseases. All I have to do is finish this class, and I'm at the last week of the class, and you go, um, everything you just did for the last 14 weeks is wrong. Your premise was wrong. You were looking at this part of the anatomy. Look at this part of the anatomy. Come on, man. So do I get mad and slap you in the face? Or do I go, you know what? What's at stake is healing the entire planet of every autoimmune disease. I'm going back 16 weeks. I'm restarting again. If I cared about what's at stake. You see, that's what they, they don't see what's at stake. They, they think it's just Jesus loves me and I'm going to die and go to heaven. So what's, there's nothing, what's at stake? There's no loss. So why start over again? Well, that's what normal folks think. Those of us who know what's at stake, why would they do that? Unless they, again, get hardened. They lose their desire for God. 
and they dry up in their, uh, their belief in what God's word says, and they become just like those who never heard the secrets and mysteries, and they think, yeah, what's at stake? Is it really real anyways? Is it really real? Is the Dyke Mon Ariston thing, is that really legit? And they go, eh, ah, you know, uh, uh, okay, okay, I, I, I would not do that if I was you, because they did that here. And he's talking about that very thing. They, they, they're like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't put much stake in that. You know, tomato, tomato, he, we're still his kids. He's not going to just, he goes, oh, oh, okay. He said, they, they tried to prove me. They found out. As a result of what they did, they found out, don't ever test me. No, don't, don't try to prove yourself to me that you can get away with this because you're not. He, they saw my works. Verse 10, he says, therefore, therefore, or Dio, or through this, I was provoked. There's your word again. This time it's uh, a little different here. So the bitter provocation is parapipkrasmos. This one is a different wording here where he says, I am provoked. This is the word poshethesi, which means I am vehemently angry. The bitter provocation was, you rebelled, I'm irritated. The para means that your rebellion and my irritation are forever linked. But here he says, therefore, because of your rebellion and my irritation, then I was provoked, I was vehemently angry. That's pretty, that, I mean, goodness gracious. To get God irritated is bad enough. Now you're saying, now he's telling you, I am vehemently angry. Why would he say two different things? Think about it. Didn't they do two different things? Well, yeah. They failed the test. They failed the parismos with not going by faith, believing who God was in his word. That made them irritated because they rebelled against him. But what else did they do? They tried to usurp Moses and Aaron. They murmured and they lied and tried to lead an insurrection on the basis of their misunderstanding and refusal to believe God in his word. And God goes, I'm already irritated enough that you refuse to believe me and my word. Now you're taking me off to be him in anger when now you're murmuring and lying against who I put in charge, which is like murmuring and lying against me. And then on top of that, you're trying to build an insurrection of others to follow suit. Oh, <sighs> he is angry. You can see why. You can see why it's bad enough that you're a dillweed and you go, ooh, ooh, ooh. then you're going to the other, you're going to murmur and lie and lead an insurrection, do just like you. Whew, I can see the anger. And now you see why Jesus went in to the temple and, you know, you know, now you see why he said you're making those double the son of Gehenna as you. Now it makes more sense, right? Because when you don't have faith, then you're leading others to be, you're murmuring, you're lying, leading the insurrection to follow even more worse than you're doing because the basic premise is that the test was believe in me or not. It's that simple. And when you don't, it'll lead you to, your rebellion leads you to murmuring and lies and insurrections against God and his word, which starts with his people, which are right in front of you, that are in the positions to tell the truth. You don't want to hear that. So here in verse 10, he says, therefore I was vehemently angry, I was provoked, that with that generation, so people say, oh gosh, God's angry with all the Jewish people. No, 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 that generation, the people who did that. That's why, remember, they died off in 40 years. It wasn't all the Israelites. It was that, those people that did that. And said they will always err. This is all, this is a, such a, so indicting, by the way. The word always is the word ai, A-E-I. It means continually and constantly. So God's saying, that's your disposition, to continually and constantly err. What does error mean? Well, the word error means to wander. It's the word planotai, written in the, again, ongoing sense. So you will ongoingly, constantly, continually be one who roam off course and deviate because you're, you, just, you, always, you always want to be misled. That's just who you are. Wow. That's pretty. So you think about that. So <laughs> now you see why God's saying you must believe what I, me and what I'm saying because our predisposition is to constantly continually want to be misled. We, we, and that's why people say, why do you like an illusionist? Why do you like a magician? Because think about it, don't lie to me. We've all been to watching a TV show or, or seen a, a Broadway show or seen, kind of, or seen a something where someone did an illusion and you're like, wow, that's pretty neat, how'd you do that? But don't lie to me now. You know the heart of that is deception, right? We all know that. But, but it still kind of makes us go, that's pretty neat. But, 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 but they're lying. <laughs> so they're deceiving you, right? So God's telling you that you're in your, in, in your heart. We want to be misled. We, we, we want to roam off course. It's our nature. It's our sinful nature to be entertained by our sins. 
And so he's saying that's why it's all the more important because you're constantly, continually in a state of wanting to be misled. You don't even realize it. That's why I'm telling you how important it is to have when the test, when the parismos is there, your, your goal is just believe in me, trust in me and my word. Trust in me and my word, not in what you think, not in what you believe, not in what you feel. Trust me and my word, me and my word. I'm telling you, and yet we don't do it. And he's telling us, the writer here in Barnabas is saying, look guys, you more than ever before, you more than anybody else, please do not make this mistake. There's too much is at stake. And he says, he says that they err in their heart, but they did not acknowledge, look at this, acknowledge my ways. You know why they didn't acknowledge his ways? The word acknowledge is the word agnosan, which comes from the nostos, meaning they didn't know about. So think about this. How could you not know about things unless what he said back in verse 8 was true? Because your heart was dried up. And when your heart dries up, that means your water of God's word in your life, his presence and his truth is absent, which means that you're not aware of what the secrets and mysteries speak to what's at stake in the future. You lose sight of it. You're not even aware of it. You don't believe me? I'm not going to name names. That's not right. But there's people that we've known that have forsaken and left things in their rearview mirror. If you said things to them today of what you know to be true from Scripture about the future airship and what's at stake, they're not going to know that at all. They're not going to have any acknowledgement or awareness of those things. Why? Because the Word of God in their life has dried up. They're stuck in where they used to be They're because of their rebellion, because of their being dried up and the things that we just talked about. They didn't continue on holding the, reso the resolve of having joy as a result of God's love and provision to give them all this information about who he is and all this opportunity to be alongside of him in the days ahead. They just take that to heart. They, don't, they didn't take it to heart. They take it as like, you know, just a throwaway. They didn't believe it's true anymore. It's just sad. And so here he says, they didn't acknowledge my ways. So all this is, it ties together. The reason that you don't acknowledge is because they were hardened, and the reason they were hardened is because they didn't hold fast. He's telling you the, the equation, okay? If you hold fast with resolve, and you always are jo joyful in God's love and provision because of that, and because of what's ahead, what's at stake in the hope, that'll help you to never become dried out and be hardened, which will lead you to not become tested by your faith and question God and His Word to forsake it, which will then not lead you to be ignorant and not acknowledging that which is true. Right? It's just that simple. He's telling you. He's not referring to those who don't know who Jesus is. He's referring to folks who know Jesus is at a higher level, the mature ones. So in verse 11 he says, So I swore. I made an oath. It's a pretty, pretty dramatic statement he makes. I made an oath in my indignation, which is his wrath, which is the word orge. And it's not just orge, it's the orge, which is the, the ultimate stored up, swelled up, fuming anger. He made an oath and fuming anger. What is, when is the wrath of God being revealed? Well, it's going to be in tribulation. Is the, is, is, is there's, there's wrath of God. The wrath of God's in tribulation. It's going to be at the, end, at the end of tribulation, the very last. There's going to be some wrath, but the wrath of God happens in the second half, specifically at Armageddon. That's when it all comes down pretty hard, man. Jehoshaphat, Gog and Magog too. That ain't funny. That's pretty, goodness gracious. A lot of death will happen. A lot of carnage. A lot of billions. And then he says, and he says, I swore my nation, if they should, they shall enter my rest. If they shall enter my rest. And that he's talking about there is the word enter into the rest is speaking to day seven. So they will not enter into day seven. Meaning, if you're of this mindset and you think, ah, I just missed out entering in the air sign. I mean, I still got, I'm going to fall short onto the, the safety net of inheriting or at least entering the earth. He says, think again. What? No, no. No, I'm not playing. Did I not, did I just kill them and let them stay on the earth? No, I opened the ground up and had them been swallowed, didn't I? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and then fire came down after that. He's telling you that if you do this, you have no chance of entering heaven or earth. You will be in Gehenna. He's not playing with you. It's not funny. If you rebel, you'll be dealt with accordingly. And Gehenna is for rebellious people. And that's where you shall be for the entire time. You will not have a change of mind in him. You will not. 
I'm telling you, it's not going to happen. So he's saying, that's where you're going to be. Now in verse 12, he says, beware, or take you heed, which is the word blepete, which is the word blepo for look, but he's talking about it in a way of observe closely, the way it's written here. Observe closely, brethren. And the word brethren, again, adelphoi. And the context back to chapter 2 to now, the adelphoi is the mature ones who are in a position to enter with a view to inheritance. So those who are of the fruit yielding that are growing in that, I would say specifically 60 and up, but 30 is in view peripherally. But the adelphoi is the mature ones with focus on the 60 and 100 with 30 still in view. But he says, take heed adelphoi, lest ever perha uh, perhaps or shall be, lest there should ever be in any one of you an evil or a paneros, which is an influenced by evil heart, by apostatizing from the living God. And the word apostatizing is the word we know, apostasis, to stand away from. You don't want to stand away from, uh, and the word there is written in the plural, ongoing. So in other words, you can stand away from God's word. You can apostate singularly, that's not what he's talking about here. He says, don't apost he says don't apostatize on an ongoing basis. How gracious is God? He's given you a, a mulligan, if you will, to say, ah, you're a sinner, you're, a, you're an idiot. You might fall off the cart and apostatize from me, stand away from the truth, but you better get back on that horse really quick because my patience runs thin. Okay? So, okay. So the gravity of that apostasy, obviously, is not what he's talking about here. But he's talking about apostasy in general could lead you to this ultimate apostasy, which gets him to this indignation and so forth. So he's saying, don't ongoingly do this, because there comes a point. Because think about it. They didn't believe by faith. There was a gap between chapter 13 and chapter 16. Then they murmured against Moses. And then they started making up other stuff and lies and leading an insurrection. And then God took their life. So they had a chance to repent. They had a chance to get right, didn't they? So God's given them a chance to change. Remember, that's why, if you remember, On changed his mind. From Dathan and Abiram and on, Korah, Dathan and Abiram and on, on changed his mind. So you have a chance, just like Miriam and Aaron. Aaron wasn't the one who was judged as culpable as Miriam was. So there is the opportunities God gives you. So God's letting you know, don't ongoingly hold this disposition. It's one thing not even to go there at all, but when you do get there, you better, better get right, man. It's just not even close to funny. I think the, the, the Korah, Dathan, and Miriam types are like, well, I'll go back to that plus 100 fold thing. It's like, no, it's not. No going back to yeah, once you know this, you can't go back. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I just lost, lost my thought on that. But they're just saying about that going back to, there's no going back to that lower level of, yeah. of what they, they knew. They, there's just no, oh, I, no going back down the way. A, any man putting his hand to the plow and looking Turn back, back. Yeah. is not fit. They're looking back. Yeah, and that's they, what. They're not fit for the kingdom of God. You that's can't look back. Yeah, remember. They got their hand to the plow. They messed up, they're looking back. They look back, yeah. And, uh, and Elisha, to your point, when he was called by Elijah and God told him, he, he cooked and ate his oxen. And he left, as if there's no chance to go back. He cooked the, the <laughs> he, he burned the bridge, Jack. I mean, he was like, <laughs> I'm not going to do oxen ever again. Just to make sure about it, I'm going to cook and eat them. Okay, I think we're good on this. Yeah. First of all, Yep. For all of day seven? Yep. Is this, the, is this only for the Jews? No, he's talking about this is for, this is the uh, Jewish people uh, that, remember, are in samples to us. And that's what the writer and Barnabas is bringing out. God's bringing out that don't follow their example because this is what's in store for you. So their physical word picture of inheritance and judgment and accountability is in similitude applied to you because he's comparing the house of Christ and the house of Moses. And he's comparing the gravity of the situation. There's much more, there's much more at stake here. And so if I treated them this way, how will I treat you when much more is at stake? Y you think about it. What do you think is gonna happen? Even worse. Yes? When Tracy said, what's the word for rest? Oh, sorry. Uh, the one I enter into my rest. Oh, I didn't write it out, but it's a, it, it means to fully be, the word kata is in front of it. I didn't write it out here, but it's the, it's the word that means to, it, to be at full repose, to be at full relax. So to be utterly relaxed. So um, meaning that you're, you're not in that place because uh, he's in the day of rest. There's two different rests. 
there's the day of rest that Christ is resting in his uh, kingship office. He's fully completed prophet and high priest. He's in the kingship office. And for those of us, we've completed out of this body of sin and death. There's no more in this state working to strive in this state. We're in a different state working, but not we're resting from this state. So it's a rest, meaning fully from what was to what is. So it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but you are resting fully from the current state. You've now entered into a new state. So that's what it's speaking to. But I don't know the actual, I didn't write the actual word down, um, but it, it, it starts with this uh, kata. And I didn't even, but it's just because the word, I write, I write the words down myself when they mean. Can you say the Greek word, please? Yeah, I don't have it offhand right now. I, I don't have it offhand, so I'm saying I didn't write it out. Usually I write it out when it's, um, means something more like elaborative, but it means the same as what you think it means in the word rest. It means rest, to be at repose. Yes? And Vicki said, uh, K-A-T-A-P-A-U-S-I-S. -S. There you go. So there's the Greek word, but I didn't write it out because it just means to be at full repose, at full rest. That's all it means. So it doesn't add anything to the, to the text other than being at full rest and repose. So when he says, take heed, observe closely at Delphoi, and the reason why Brother Todd's point about chapter, uh, chapter uh, 3, verse 11, why is he, he should use the word not, they should not enter my rest. And because he's saying that, he says, so I swore my indignation. You have to see, he's, he's saying that, meaning he's saying that statement in anger. He's not making a statement. He is, he's sounding, in other words, I'm not going to yell at you right now, but because I raise my voice to enough people say, don't do that, I hate that when you do that. Sorry. But I'm just trying to, it's just the emotion of the verses and of what God's word saying. But in this context, he's raising his voice. It's like he's, you know, he's, he's banging the, the table, as like Christ did in the temple. So when he said, so I swore in my indignation, if they shall enter my rest. In other words, as if they will enter my rest. That's what he's basically saying, right? So he's just pounding the, I, you, you think they're gonna, you, you can enter my rest. As if, you know, that's what he's basically saying. He's making a statement as if a, it's a, hypo, it's a hypothetical slam at them to think you can actually believe it you can live that way and there's not consequences because there is that that's what it's basically the the inference is meant from that grammatical structure there yeah Vicky said yes as if yeah it's, it's like it's what he's basically saying it's like you know as if you think you know so that, that that's what he basically so look back in verse 12 when he said again uh so pay close attention observe closely brethren lest in other words, pay closely to, to what? He says, observe closely what? What are you supposed to observe closely? Well, you know what? Jesus, him, and and his word, and how we're supposed to have an ongoing, going back to the confidence, we're supposed to have the ton parision, the resolving boldness and conviction of the joy that is because of his love and provision to us, because of the inheritance he's given us out ahead. That's what he's saying, observe closely. Him and what he's given you. And what he requires of us, the three things. Who he is, what is required of us, and, and what he's what he's what's at stake. Observe that closely so that you don't fall into apostasy. So because that will help you not to go there, right? Always keeping that in front of you. These all these positive people always say, these Tony Robbins people will always go, right now what you want to be on a piece of little sticky thing and put it on your steering wheel, put it on your refrigerator, put it in your mirror. That's because they know the human mind, when it constantly sees something, it's constantly going to be aware of it and, and strive to fulfill it. It's true. So that's what he's saying here. So if you want to put that in front of your face, then do so. Remember, put, put it in your own words, who God has shown you who he is. Put what's at stake, the accountability, and put what, what glorious option, what glorious awesomeness is ahead of you if you just continue to realize what's at stake and what he's given you on a good side of things. Yeah? Todd said, thank you, Preston and Vicki. Yeah. I just can't help thinking the, the chorus of Galatians they saw the privilege, but not the responsibility. They saw all the dress that Moses was going through. They thought maybe they would get that, and never they wouldn't have the problems Moses no. had. Oh, Jim Price. No, I know, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, babe. Pam said apostasy is plural. Apostasy is plural. Yeah, it's in the AS in the Alpha Sigma. So it's a it's a plural meaning an ongoing state of apostasy, uh, is what he's talking about. So which is interesting, which means the inverse is. Is interesting that you can have a state, you can be having a occurrence of apostasy, which I would think uh, would be moments of rebellion against God are one thing. A state of mind, a disposition of apostasy is quite another. Because we're sinners. God's given us a little 
which is really comforting to know. In verse 12, he's basically telling you it's not the, it's not the moment of apostasy he's focused in on here. It's the, it's the disposition that you have wholesale, deliberately sold yourself out to rebellion. That's a little different. So, because you can be in apostasy, but then maybe like an intervention to an addiction person, you can get woken up by something. You, you can be that one rare breed of person that God says things to your heart and spirit and mind that wake you up to go, whoa, I'm going to get back to right again. It happens. It doesn't happen that often. I wouldn't take that chance. Then it's going to be you. But that's why he says the phrasing, the ongoing person is the one that's got, you know, the biggest fear here. Um, everybody has a fear. Don't go down that path at all. But it's definitively a dangerous slope if you're in a continual state. And so he says, and, the, and, and that's why he says also the falling away is also in the constant, the, the aplastemi, which is the, the, the constantly standing away from. So the stand away from, uh, the apostasis to, to uh, again, to stand away from God's, God's word, um, and you're doing it constantly. The apostasis to apo, uh, to stand away from. And you're doing it again, apostemi, you're not standing firm. You're, not, you're constantly not standing firm. You're constantly being impressionable and wishy-washy with things. So that's the other word, apostemi, whereas the other one is apostias. So one is apostasy ongoing, means you continue to stand away from the truth. And the other one is you're constantly not standing firm on the truth. You're constantly being, you know, pliable. You're constantly questioning God's word. And you, and you can't do that. And so he says, well, if, you, if he says here, do not do that, basically. He says, if anyone who have you have this kind of a heart, disbelieving or apostatizing, that's what he calls it. But it should say, anybody who is constantly standing away from God and who is constantly not being fully convicted of what God, who he is and what his word says, he says, you, you, you need to stop doing this because he's the living God. What's, why, why would he say living God? Think about that, right? Because, you know why? 